Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Audrey Paddox and I'm the research manager at the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. So we have a few tips for getting the most out of uh, the seminar today. If you have not already switched your Zoom to speaker view, we encourage you to do so. Uh, on your Zoom screen in the top right hand corner, you should see an icon. If the wording under the icon says gallery view, click on the icon once and this should change it to speaker view. If for some reason you were not muted upon entry, we ask that you mute yourself to eliminate any background noise or feedback during the presentation. I would also like to alert you to the chat icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If a comment or question occurs to you during the presentation portion of the seminar, we ask that you please type the question or comment in the chat box and we will review these during the question and answer portion at the end of the seminar. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. I'd like to begin the webinar by recognizing and acknowledging that McMaster University is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. During this webinar, I'll be speaking about MIRA, our research and the ways we support trainees in aging research, including our 2021 funding opportunities. Our second speaker, Dr. Samantha Sandassi, is the Education and Training Program Manager at AgeWell NCE. Canada's Technology and Aging Network. Her portfolio includes the development, implementation, and evaluation of AgeWell's training curriculum, over 10 scholarship and award programs, and all training-related partnerships. Today, she'll be discussing AgeWell's 2021 funding opportunities, including the trainee awards co-funded by Mira and AgeWell, which are meant to support trainees at McMaster doing research in the space of aging and technology. So I'd like to give you some background on Mira. The McMaster Institute for Research on Aging was formed in 2016 as the university recognized the great challenges that an aging population will present to humanity and to science. And it was meant to connect McMaster's multiple aging platforms and six faculties where we have enormous aging research capacity. We have, it's home to leading researchers addressing aging research questions um, across, I mentioned all six of our faculties, so those are engineering, social sciences, science, humanities, the faculty of health sciences, and uh, the DeGroote School of Business. Uh, in addition, we're home to aging platforms, including JARIS, uh, which is within St. Peter's Hospital, the Gilbrea Center for Studies in Aging within the Faculty of Social Sciences, PACE, or the Physical Activity Center of Excellence in Kinesiology, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, the Optimal Aging Portal and several others. And uh, so it's our goal to bring together researchers and students from across these platforms and disciplines and support interdisciplinary research that leads to, leads to impactful solutions and, and helps solve some of the biggest challenges aging presents. And this picture here is from when we used to do that uh, quite literally bringing people together at McMaster Innovation Park. And we look forward to doing that again, but we are still doing our best to do that virtually. And our funding uh, programs reflect that. So the way we do this, we, we combine three elements. Uh, we, we first are coordinating a collaborative research agenda that brings together clinicians and academics from all faculties. Uh, we also facilitate ongoing interactions with stakeholders. So those stakeholders might be older adults, people in industry, um, uh, people working in the public, serve, public sector, and uh, we connect our researchers to each other and, and to these stakeholders. And finally, we use design thinking to help generate human-centered solutions. Uh, people often ask us what we mean by design thinking, so I would like to tell you a little bit about that. So one way to conceptualize design thinking is to think about the innovations that can occur where need, possibility, and opportunity intersect. And I often ask academic folks to think about where most academic research occurs. Is it within the realm of what's possible? Is it a reaction to an opportunity, perhaps a funding opportunity? How often are the needs of users considered in research? I would argue that that is the most uh, commonly missing item. And uh, at Miro, we hope to help people bring these three sort of realms together and, and um, and facilitate research that, that is truly innovative. So in, ador in addition, we support about 87 trainees. Uh, that includes postdoctoral fellows, masters, uh, PhD, uh, graduate students, and uh, some undergrad research fellows, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, this is a screenshot from their uh, trainee blog where they 
uh, tell research stories and have some information on how people can get together and um, join. They have monthly meetings the last Friday of the month just to connect and um, other types of events as well. All of our funded trainees become part of the trainee network and um, participate in some of the networking events that we have going on. One of them, this is an example of one. It also happens to be occurring next week. So Meet My Method is a, a training network driven event where the trainees will be coming together to uh, share the ways they do their research. So they might find out um, the skill sets and the interests of their colleagues and other faculty members that might be complementary to their challenges in aging research and think about ways that they might collaborate together. So uh, it's not too late to register for that. You can see the bit.ly at the bottom and I'll share that in the chat when I'm done, um, but you're free to join us and hear about um, the research going on among our trainees and also some, some inspiring words from our keynote and plenary speakers. So what does Mira research look like? If you're thinking about applying to any of our funding opportunities, you might be curious about the types of things that we do fund. Um, it is more often than not interdisciplinary and our expectations for that are greater as the level of the trainees education uh, grows. Uh, and our, we support research spanning the entire university. So all six of the faculties that I mentioned, and we are focused on improving the lives of older adults. So research that will have impact for, for older adults in this lifetime. Uh, so some examples of some mirror research. These are some uh, webinars that we've given in the past. These are all mirror researchers who are working on projects that are interdisciplinary and uh, often uh, solve problems, wicked problems that we talk about. So um, looking at the top, you, uh, Marla Beauchamp is leading a, a project in the space of mobility and uh, looking at technological solutions for assessing and, and influencing older adults' mobility. Um, the next uh, one, Andrea Gonzalez and, and Dr. Amy Montour spoke about how intergenerational trauma can affect life course. And as people age, um, there, there are a lot of things to consider when we're looking at the way we care for people and respect their, their life histories. Um, on the bottom left, doctors uh, James Gillette and Dee Mangin spoke about uh, polypharmacy from a social science perspective and, and from a family medicine perspective and how difficult solving issues around polypharmacy can actually be when we, when we start to look at older adults' individual situations. And uh, the last one on the bottom right, Dr. Stu Phillips and Meredith Griffin talked about exercise and how it's one of those things that we know is uh, so important. It has all types of benefits. And, and Dr. Stu Phillips looks at some of those at a, a very uh, basic science level. And um, that was complemented by Dr. Meredith Griffin who talks, uh, who, who does research on how, um, how difficult sometimes it can be to, to uh, implement exercise interventions and what the challenges are and, and, and the ways to get around those. Um, so I'd like to also address the elephant in the room. How do we do research in the context of COVID-19? And uh, I'd like to invite uh, Mira's research coordinator, Jazine Alders, who uh, has supported our researchers and trainees over the past year as they've attempted to pivot and adjust their research paradigms to, um, to fit within the COVID-19 research restrictions. And Jazine, can you unmute yourself? Sure, hi. So currently phase two research guidelines from the university state that with the exception of COVID-19 research, no research involving high-risk individuals is permitted and that includes older adults. So um, yeah, what, we, what can we do this year? I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of what people have done in the past. So some ideas of research that we funded um, in the last round is accessing data from the Canadian Longitudinal Study in Aging. Um, that is free of charge to graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, there are also open access databases that you can access to complete secondary data analyses. We have funded literature reviews, scoping reviews, systematic reviews. I am also encourage um, meta-analyses. The development of machine learning algorithms to predict events such as falls or fracture risk. The development of wearable or sensing devices that have an application in helping older adults or people with disabilities aging in place. Uh, the development of software to assess loneliness through written narratives of older adults is also something that we've funded or collecting and compiling qualitative or quantitative data from survey information or a semi-structured interview that you could administer virtually or over the telephone. Um, there's also the option of basic science experiments looking at aging at the neuronal level or even animal studies. 
So some of the studies that we funded in the last year, including many secondary, secondary data analyses included uh, the development of clinical tools to guide diagnosis and treatment of osteoporosis in older adults, strategies for implementing an electronic fracture risk assessment tool in long-term care, um, improving physical activity and mobility during a pandemic via live online exercise sessions for persons, for older persons, and that was a pilot randomized controlled trial. Um, looking at imaging to do a semi-automatic automated method for analysis of cere cerebrovascular anatomy, characterizing the heart rate variability in an aging population living with and without stroke. Older people as research partner is a systematic review of implementation and impact. And um, and on and on. So there were a lot of um, studies that we were still able to fund, uh, even though older adults weren't directly being um, interviewed because of the physical distancing guidelines. And I encourage you, if you have an idea and you're not sure about whether it will work or not, that you could bounce it off Audrey or I, and we'd be happy to give you some feedback. Back to you, Audrey. Thanks, Jazeen. So uh, now I'll just take you through the um, funding opportunities that are available to trainees in 2021. And um, starting with uh, the undergraduate summer research fellowships. So these awards are meant to support undergraduate students who are returning to the university in the fall. So if you are graduating this year, you would be ineligible. Uh, and there are awards of $1,000. They must be topped up by the supervisor. So um, we, we call it full time for the summer. We allow the student and the supervisor to really define what that means. Um, but the, we do expect to see full time work. And we ask the student to seek out a supervisor and, um, and devise a project with them and then submit to us a proposal for, uh, for a summer project and a letter of support from the supervisor along with this, uh, the, McMahon, the um, USRF fellowship application. Uh, we also have awards for our current graduate students. So Mira uh, trainees who are already here can look for support for uh, student professional development. And uh, we are still sort of defining what that looks like in the era of COVID. These um, used to, of course, support graduate student travel, and uh, there's not a lot of travel going on. And so the types of activities we've defined that these might support would be including online courses, pre presenting at an academic conference or um, where you are required to pay to attend or attend some kind of training program, all of, uh, you know, virtual if required and in person if, if allowed at that time. And these awards are tenable for a year up to uh, up to a year after the application deadline. So things may open up. And uh, what if you do attend the, uh, um, the event or the training, then we, we would uh, reimburse you the costs after the fact. Um, and this requires a match from a uh, either your supervisor or some other external source. So uh, we can see that there is, there is still support for that student from other sources. And the deadline for that is coming up in March as well. And um, we offer, offer scholarships for graduate students in two streams. So uh, we are funding both masters and PhD students in the MIRA uh, scholarship in aging research stream as well as the Labarge Mobility Scholarship. So the Labarge Mobility Scholarship, a lot of people might be familiar with from previous years. It supports um, a any research that's focused on mobility and aging and has traditionally not been open to people whose work is more uh, in a more broad aging topic. We're now supporting uh, through the McMaster Scholarship in Aging Research, research that falls outside of that. And uh, we hope to fund up to four students this year, two masters and two PhD, one in each of these streams. So for the master's level award, you have to be a new student entering in the 2021, 2022 school year. And PhD students can be entering either year one or two. Um, this is an interdisciplinary award. So you would need to have a supervisor who's a MIRA member as well as a mentor from a faculty who is outside of that supervisors. Um, if you have somebody in mind who's not a MIRA member yet, either for the supervisor or mentor, it's a fairly straightforward process for them to become a MIRA member. If their research is in aging areas, uh, we would welcome them. So um, you, that's, uh, that's not a barrier, but they would have to become a MIRA, MIRA member before we'd be able to, uh, to fund one of their students. 
the um, Mira and Labarge postdoctoral fellowships program. So similarly, we have two streams. Um, the Mira stream would fund uh, aging research more broadly. The Labarge mobility stream, again, would um, uh, fund mobility research. And uh, this year, we'll actually have up to seven awards. One will be dedicated to mobility uh, related research and the remaining six will fund uh, aging research more broadly. These awards are $50,000 for one year and uh, an additional $3,000 is awarded for expenses related to research. And uh, this is an interdisciplinary award as well. So in this case, we need uh, our prospective fellows to have a MIRA supervisor and two collaborating um, mentors involved in the project. So it's a three faculty collaboration and the principal supervisor would be um, in a given faculty and the other two would be from other faculties. And uh, the project we expect to be um, thoroughly interdisciplinary. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that might mean in a moment. Uh, lastly, this is not trainee funding, but for any faculty members who may have joined us who might be thinking of ways to support uh, a trainee, um, they can also apply to our Catalyst Grants program. The deadline is approaching. It's on April 30th. These are $40,000 awards and they can be used uh, to fund trainees. So this would be an award that the faculty member could hold. They again are interdisciplinary. Uh, they're awarded at the faculty level. So each faculty gets to choose the award from uh, the award recipient from their faculty. And that project should have at least three different McMaster faculties involved in, in the research. Uh, and so uh, any faculty members who want to hear a little bit more about this are encouraged to reach out to me. I, I, can, I can talk to you about what those projects typically look at like and, and how they might find collaborators. So uh, I want to give you a little bit of insight on the evaluation criteria that we would apply. These are um, not the complete suite of evaluation criteria, but they're the ones that are common to all of the awards that I've mentioned already. And of course, as you uh, escalate the uh, level of uh, sophistication and project and, and uh, trainee, tra the trainees level from undergrad through to postdoc, we would have higher expectations. Um, but the first thing that we are looking at is, is, is the project connected to MIRA objectives. Now we look at the trainees background and uh, uh, grades and CV, but we're, we're looking very closely at the project and how, how good of a fit it is to uh, our objectives. So we're looking again for interdisciplinarity, innovation, engaging older adults and stakeholders, as I discussed earlier. Um, when we're looking at the, the project itself, is it feasible? Of course, we're going to have to look at this in a, in a new light in the era of COVID-19. Can it be done? Is it flexible? Does, are there multiple ways to complete this given uh, different levels of COVID-19 restrictions? It would be something we'll be looking at this year. And um, are, they, are they planned analysis um, suitable? Or are you going to be able to answer the research question you identified using the work uh, that you're, you're laying out to do? Um, the supervisor suitability. So these next two points are, are talking about whether the supervisor that the, that the uh, trainee has proposed to work with is a good fit for that project, if they'll be, be able to provide adequate supervision. Uh, similarly, the, the collaborators and mentors, are they, are they uh, suitable? Or do they plan to work together in a truly interdisciplinary and collaborative way? And what's the plan for that collaboration? So we like to see a plan for how, how this project is truly um, going to bring those researchers together and, and how that trainee is going to get um, support from the collaborators they've identified. Um, this, this would apply more specifically to our more senior candidates, so postdoctoral fellows in, um, in particular. So does, does the candidate have uh, potential for research leadership? Um, what, what, light, what type of uh, career trajectory is this person on and, and how is this fellowship going to help propel them toward that? Um, so this is, uh, this is criteria that would be uh, applied specifically to our postdoctoral fellows, but just to give you an idea of, of how we're looking for the research project to, to support that candidate. Uh, so if you have any questions related to the MIRA specific funding, you can type them in the chat box and we'll address all of the questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can also email questions to MIRA fund at any time. And 
I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Sam Sandassi now, but before I do that, I would like to take the opportunity to plug this upcoming Miro webinar, uh, Dimension and Driving. So that will feature Dr. Richard Stramko, a geriatrician and assistant professor at McMaster who focuses on e-health interventions related to patient education and physician communication and technologies for home health monitor. And Dr. Brenda Verklian, who is a professor and occupational therapist who has expertise in automobile technology and mobility in older adults. So Sam, if you're able to share your screen, I'll hand it over to you and everybody else. I hope uh, you can join us on March 11th and I'll add uh, a registration link to the chat when I'm done. Thank you so much, Audrey. So hopefully you guys can all see, uh, see my screen appropriately. If so, give me a thumbs up. Beautiful. Okay, so as Audrey said, I'm Samantha Sandassi, and at AgeWell, I manage the education and training portfolio. And that includes everything from curriculum development to partnerships to career mentorship, research awards, and scholarships. And I'm super excited to join you guys here today to share a little bit more about AgeWell generally, the work we're doing, the future we're envis envisioning, and some of the opportunities that we'll have available for us to work together in the future. So AgeWell is a national, federally funded networks of centers of excellence. We were funded in 2015, and we're a network of researchers, older adults, caregivers, community and industry partners, government decision makers, and students such as yourselves. And together, we conduct research, we create and commercialize technologies and services, and we influence Canadian policies in order to, do, as you see here, accelerate the delivery of technology-based solutions to make a meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. We want to help older adults maintain independence, health, and quality of life. So this figure should be quite familiar to most of you working in, in, in aging, right? Population aging is dramatically changing the demographic structure of the world. In Japan, over 25% of the population is over the age of 65. In Canada, we're expected to reach that percentage about 20 years from now. The rapidity of population aging presents a huge challenge. While the population is healthier generally, with increasing age comes differences in uh, capacity con to conduct activities of daily living and an increased number of chronic conditions. We are, and our infrastructure is, completely unprepared really to support the needs of the vast quantities of older people that we're likely to see in the future. Technology has been recognized as one way to address this challenge, one way, one solution. Gerund technology or H-Tech, they're just two of the terms that have been used, that have been coined to describe technology products developed to improve the lives of older adults. H-Tech is just technology built for the needs of older adults and caregivers. When you think of the most successful countries in H-Tech, we think of Japan, we think of some of the Scandinavian countries, but we don't think about Canada because over the past 15 years or so, there's been a huge increase in the number of Canadian researchers working in this field. We just haven't seen that translated into things like commercially available products, new services, or innovative policies. We have a population of older adults that are comfortable with technology and ready to use it. And from this slide, you can see the same number of those are actually confident with current technology and they think tech is a positive force in their lives and could help them improve their lives but they're not using it for health and wellness purposes. So in Canada and worldwide, really, the op opportunities in this space abound. Audrey spoke earlier about addressing needs, and there's a huge unmet need here. The so-called silver economy is massive, and it's a major opportunity for businesses such as this tiny selection of our age well partners here to really grow the age tech field in Canada. There's a race internationally to integrate technology into everyday life in Asia, in Europe, and in the US, and Canada has really lagged behind. And there's a, there are a number of reasons for this. For academics, such as ourselves specifically, research funding can be a pretty big crapshoot, right? Like in order to succeed academically, we tend to work in silos. We target one small piece of a really large complex topic, a wicked problem, as, as Audrey mentioned earlier, and we pump out journal articles and conference papers. This way of working, of, of, staying, of staying in our lanes, has led to immense knowledge fragmentation. And even if you have a great idea or a prototype, 
jumping to a marketable product isn't easy. It requires a bunch of new knowledge and skills that we generally don't get in our academic training. So to that end, in the past six years now, we've honed what we call the age well way as a method to bridge the gap between excellent research and real world impact. And it's required a huge culture shift in the age tech sector in academia in Canada. The age well way rests on three core pillars. The first is co-creation, co-creation with stakeholders. That is the older adults and caregivers themselves. We need to see a sharing of power between researchers and knowledge users because the kind of collaboration uh, when you're working so closely with your end user, it leads to better science. It leads to more relevant, more actionable research findings, and it leads to mutual learning. Secondly, transdisciplinarity. And speaking of mutual learning, this is a way of working that requires collaboration with a multiplicity of disciplines. Much like Yura's focus on interdisciplinarity, we're looking, um, we're looking to have a diverse, uh, a diverse research group working together. And the reason for this is kind of obvious, right? Like a psychologist, a physician, a gerontologist, and a computer scientist working together are more likely to be successful in solving the problem of say medication mismanagement than any one or two of these disciplines together. And third and last, it's integrated knowledge mobilization commercialization. So creating and marketing solutions requires a networked approach to innovation. It requires collaboration with industry, it requires talking to policymakers and ensuring once again that, trans that, that findings are translational at all times. So we've spent the past six years building AgeWell as a network to foster collaboration. And I'd like to think that we've succeeded. We're hosted jointly by Simon Fraser University and the University Health Network in Toronto. Uh, our management office is, is based in Toronto as well. We have four innovation hubs that are focused on very specific problem areas. Uh, two are based in BC, one's based here in Ontario, and another is based in Fredericton. In addition, we have 47 startups that we support financially, and we're comprised of 250 researchers and 1,000 of these projects is working closely with partners from industry, government, and the not-for-profit sector to ensure the project outcomes make it out of your research lab. Moreover, our projects are working closely with a cohort of older adults and caregivers as well. And these take a very active role as co-creators on projects, not just as validators of a final solution. Our focus is really on making impact and affecting change. As you can see here, these are just some of the solutions that have come out of, uh, come out of AgeWell in the past few years. There are 118 thus far, and these, as you can see, take shape in a variety of ways. We're not just about creating technologies, creating new technologies. We're also looking at technology-related policies and practices, as well as services. All of the research that's funded at AgeWell, and this includes the trainee uh, research program as well, is built on this platform of these eight challenge areas that we've identified as the critical areas uh, where technology can improve the lives of older adults and caregivers in Canada. So our entire research platform is, is built on these eight areas very specifically. And I'm going to go through a few different projects really, really quickly that give you an idea of some of the types of things that we've funded thus far. So for our first uh, challenger, supporting homes and communities, um, this is an example of a, an ageable project uh, led by a postdoctoral fellow, then PhD student actually, Dr. Noah Lana Neubauer, where this project contributed to policy change. They worked with a member of the Alberta Legislative Assembly to inform an evidence-based decision to expand missing persons legislation. No Lana's work resulted in Bill 210. So that's the Missing Persons or Silver Alert Amendment Act. And that came into force in 2018, and it includes older adults with cognitive challenges. In addition, some of her colleagues in her lab helped develop a technology and app that allows local community volunteers to look for missing persons in their neighborhood. And there's a support system, uh, a service that's a support system for the app as well. 
for healthcare and health service delivery. This particular team based out of the University of Saskatchewan and, and also at UHN jointly, they're developing innovative and affordable solutions to improve pain management in people with dementia who reside in LTCs. So in addition to that, what they're doing is they're creating a, and they're developing and evaluating, I should say, a web-based training platform in pain assessment for staff in rural and remote long-term care facilities. They've gone a long way with knowledge mobilization efforts using social media, and um, they've gained quite a bit of traction across LTCs in Canada. Third, co-pilot, so mobility and transportation. Uh, this is a great example of one of our core research projects driven by a PhD student that has gone through the whole innovation pipeline at AgeWell starting from 2015. As a PhD student, uh, Dr. Pooja Viswanathan, uh, the woman sitting in the wheelchair in the middle, uh, started working on a project that looked at how she could maintain and increase mobility uh, of older adults in the face of cognitive decline. So she developed a smart home, or sorry, a smart mobility system that uses sensors, it uses robotics and artificial intelligence. And what it does as a, as a product, it actually, um, it's a unique product that's an add-on device that adds intelligent features to existing powered wheelchairs and scooters. For staying connected, and this one is quite broad as well, um, I've got two examples. And the first is actually a, a McMaster Amira trainee, Dr. Aki Kirilainen, that some of you may know. And Aki is actually jointly funded by Agewell and Amira. He's a postdoctoral fellow in linguistics and languages at Mac and Brock. And he sees the effects of social isolation and loneliness in the language that seniors use. So what he's doing and his team is doing is working on two software applications that identify the linguistic markers of social isolation and loneliness in the personal life stories written by older adults. So training, preparing future leaders. At AgeWell, we really do believe that trainees are the catalyst to drive AgeWell's, well, not just AgeWell's, but Canada's future in the age tech sector. So just about half, a little bit more than half of AgeWell funding of our age well budget goes towards trainee salaries, supporting trainee programming, and ensuring that uh, there are scholarships and conference support and internships and mentorship opportunities available to you. One of the things that we offer uh, is, is called our EPIC program. And EPIC stands for Early Professionals Inspired Careers. And that program is really the umbrella term that we use for all things training at age well. And that includes our Innovators of Tomorrow Certificate Program. This is a four course online program that is completely free of charge. And what it is, is a program that's really focused on helping trainees to consider the economic, the social, environmental and ethical implications of their work. It's really, um, it's a knowledge based and comp it's a, sorry, a knowledge based and competency based program that is really a, uh, there to help train you as students or as postdoctoral fellows to deliver uh, technology-based solutions to older adults and caregivers in Canada. So it covers everything from the biological and, and, and social impacts of, of aging to um, working with First Nations, uh, First Nations communities to understanding the healthcare system in Canada all the way through to commercialization. Now for some funding opportunities. As you all heard, making real world impact is basically at the heart of everything we do at AgeWell. So to that end, we actively support our trainees to make their research accessible in the marketplace. For those of you that are interested in entrepreneurship, next month, we will launch our fourth year of our Emerging Entrepreneur Awards. And this is a $25,000 award that aims to support a young entrepreneur on their journey to creating a sustainable or viable business. Some past examples really quickly. On the left, we have Chao Bian, who has developed a computer vision-based mobile application for end-to-end -end automation of physiotherapy management. In the middle, postdoctoral Victor Fernandez, he's developed a serious game platform using uh, VR. And Virtual Gym, his, his company, 
um, it really got older adults through personalized exercises for fitness and rehabilitation. On the right, a PhD student, Azadeh Dalmash, um, Dalmalki, sorry, developed a, a smartwatch, a medical smartwatch called the Vital Tracer. And Vital Tracer actually monitors vital signs like blood pressure, uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, and blood oxygen levels. And her work is particularly interesting because it has a, a COVID twist to it because by monitoring these vital signs, the watch can actually provide a detection of COVID for those that are pre-symptomatic and potentially reduce uh, disease transmission. So in addition, we also offer a number, a significant number of graduate and postdoctoral scholarships. And these scholarships, I'd really encourage you to, to take a look at our website. The URL is on the top left of your screen. The majority of these awards and scholarships listed on our site are open to anyone enrolled full-time at a Canadian institution. Your, citizen, your citizenship doesn't matter. You just need to be enrolled full-time. And our next round of annual graduate and postdoctoral awards opens in May. These awards in particular, well, it'll open on April 30th, rather. Let me clarify that. It'll open on April 30th and close on May 31st, 2021. The award application from last year is on this website, and I'd encourage you all to take a look at it because it's very unlikely to change this year. The awards here for typically for um, for master's students, start at $10,000. For PhD students, 15. And for postdoctoral students, 20. But what's really interesting for you guys in particular is that we have a partnership developed with, uh, with Mira that offers an age well Mira award with higher dollar values. So master's students are 15, doctoral students are 20, and postdoctoral students are 50. The important dates, the application dates are the exact same. These are one year awards uh, from the 1st of September, 2021 to the 31st of August, 2022. The application is the same. Uh, you will simply need to check off a box indicating that you are eligible to receive one of these awards. Eligibility is open to any master's, doctoral or postdoctoral student enrolled at McMaster, and that is a part of Mira. So these um, these awards, we're really looking for three things, and this is the really important part. We're looking for scholarly, scholarly merit and the quality of your proposed research, very similar to what I talked about earlier for the Mira awards. But we're also looking that you're able to demonstrate a fit with AgeWell goals and priorities that you've taken a look at our focus on real world impact, that you can demonstrate that your work is transdisciplinary in nature and that you are going beyond just the typical academic publications and presentations, that you do have interaction with stakeholders such as older adults and caregivers, that they are involved in your process, in your research process, and that you are thinking about them as end users uh, as you're designing your, your project. And last, we do look at the quality of the training environment as well. And uh, as Audrey mentioned earlier, it's very, it's very similar for us. We're looking at who's your supervisor, who's um, supporting your work generally, what's actually possible in terms of uh, and feasible in terms of what you can do as part of that lab, for example. And uh, I would like to point out as part of the slide that Audrey and Justine should jump in here because there's some additional support that Mira is willing and able to offer uh, your trainees as, as you um, as you prepare your applications this year. Audrey? Uh, that's right. Uh, thanks, Sam. So we, uh, we would like to give the uh, Mira trainees who are interested in applying to this award the opportunity for an internal review at Mira. Uh, these applications are ultimately vetted by AgeWell. So uh, you can send them to us first. Uh, our deadline for internal re review will be May 7th and we'll uh, return those to you in two weeks to incorporate comments. So if you're going to do that, you would want to start probably before um, 
age wells portal actually opens on april 30th and as, as sam mentioned you can go online and take a look at the previous year's application which is not expected to change much um, and so if you'd like to take us up on that offer we are, we'll send another email around to um, the mira trainee network to uh, remind you of those dates and the uh, email you'd be sending those to would be to the mira funding email mira fund at mcmaster.ca but um, there will be a follow-up email sent out to the mira trainee network on on how to take advantage of that opportunity for our internal review. Thanks, Audrey. And I just have one last slide to share. So as an NCE, membership in our network is really, um, it, it's really restricted to just the trainees and the researchers that are funded by us, funded by our projects, or funded through you know, our project grants or our trainee grants. But that said, we've developed an affiliates program for our trainees. It's about four years old right now and i'd say a quarter of our our trainee number is made up of affiliate hqps who don't actually receive research funding or salary support from us and i'd encourage you to take a look at the website there and get involved get involved in age well because it's not um it's not just about funding opportunities. It's not just this, this big scholarship award. We do have some smaller travel awards as well, some internal ones, as well as additional internal um, supports for things like inter internships, mentorship, uh, job support, so professional development support, as well as research, um, research webinars, lectures, scholarships, summer institutes, that sort of thing as well. So I'd encourage you to reach out there. Uh, the email address, the general email address to our training, <clears throat> our training team is up on the screen. If you have any questions at all about the, uh, about the awards and your applications, or you have any questions about AgeWell, please do feel free to reach out directly and someone from the team will respond to you. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, guess we can start taking questions. Sure, I can read them aloud. So if you have any uh, further questions, please type them in the chat. And we do have a few already there, so uh, we can start to address them. The first one is whether uh, this is for Mira's Professional Development Award for grad students and whether trainees can submit more than one application for different opportunities, for example, a conference registration and, and an online course. And I would say, yes, you're allowed to submit multiple applications. There is no guarantee you might get multiply funded, but please go ahead and submit for anything that you think would be a good fit. Um, the next question, uh, I'm, uh, it's for Jazine, and it was about whether there were, um, so we, we've talked about that how the university is not currently allowing interactions with older adults for research. Can you cl clarify what types of interactions might be allowed? Can people still do phone interviews or focus groups virtually, et cetera? Yes, absolutely. We just can't have in-person interactions where you're not able to maintain the physical distancing. So yeah, virtual, um, telephone. Yeah, I think that kind of covers what you can do <laughs> without being in the same room with somebody. There are, there are still um, a, a lot of projects that you can do without directly physically interacting with older adults. Thank you, Jacine. Um... The next question is, uh, do collaborators for the postdoctoral award have to be from McMaster? Can we collaborate with scientists at the hospitals or faculties from others universities? So the, the minimum uh, collaborators, so three faculty members from three different faculties must be from McMaster. However, you can include additional mentors on your application. Uh, and this is true for the master's award for the uh, postdoctoral fellows and the catalyst grants as well. Uh, if there is somebody who would be a great fit to mentor you and, and uh, be, be a participant in the development of that project, they are welcome to do so, but you would still have to have the minimum uh, number of uh, McMaster applicants involved as well. And um, I think that is it for questions. Oh, here's another one. Um, if you are holding an existing uh, PDF award from Mira, can you apply for a Mira Labarge PDF or AgeWell Mira PDF in the coming year, 2021? So um, you cannot hold a, a, a second Mira PDF award. So it's, it's a non-renewable award. However, if you were to apply for the, the AgeWell award, 
uh, you would certainly be eligible for the age well standalone award, which is the uh, lesser value that Sam mentioned. And we would also consider funding you for the age well MIRA um, funding uh, independently. It would be, I think, more attractive if the project that you're proposing for that second award is, is fundamentally different from the first thing we funded you for. Uh, that would be my my advice on that. Um, and I, I think it would really depend on, on the type of project that you proposed. Uh, I have another question. If you're receiving MIRA match funding for an external award that ends um, in August, are you eligible to apply for a MIRA PDF award? Uh, and I, th I think, so we have also co-funded awards with, um, with other agencies, including the Canadian Frailty Network. And so um, I would say, yes, you would be eligible. Again, we're looking uh, probably to, to fund work that has uh, developed and is, is somehow different from anything we've previously funded. We would not be looking to fund uh, work that has not been finished um, in the time that was um, allocated to, to that work. Um, but uh, these are uh, distinct awards. And so you would be eligible to apply. Okay, so if um, I think that uh, uh, we, we might be done with questions and the uh, webinar itself will be posted to our website within a few days so you can return to it and, and take a look at anything that you might um, want to see again. Uh, I would also encourage you to reach out to us if you have any questions using our Mira, um, Mira fund email. That's mirafund at mcmaster.ca or the emails or the contacts that um, Sam gave you anything specific to the age well opportunity, um, certainly go, go to those contacts to ask them first. They'll, they'll uh, be the best people to answer questions about age well specific requirements. Um, and with that, are there, is there anything else to add, Jazine? We'll see everybody on the 11th for our, um, thanks Sam. Sam's just put the email up in the chat for questions for age well awards. Um, if you uh, would like to join us, I've got two links in the chat there for you to take a look at. You can register now for uh, our dementia and driving, which is very relevant to some of the aging and technology uh, topics discussed. Uh, webinar happening on March 11th, as well as the next Mira trainee event happening on March 12th, which is Meet My Method. Anyways, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone, take care.